Okay, well, we'll begin. Uh, happy Friday, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm sorry that we can't do this in person and share some of the beautiful stories and successes of these students, as well as the opportunity to share in a beautiful meal together. But uh, the good news is, is things are improving and soon enough, we'll be back together again. So this is the first time we've done uh, this public talk as a virtual event. Um, and uh, you all are pretty aware of Zoom at this point. So um, I think uh, if you have any immediate questions, you can post them in the chat, uh, but there'll be times for Q&A coming up. My name is Joe Trumpy. I am faculty at the Stamp School of Art and Design. I also have appointments with the program in the environment through the College of Literature, Science and Arts and also at the School for Sustainability and a School for Environment and Sustainability. And I'm the director of the university's sustainable living experience. I've had the distinct pleasure of being the cohort leader uh, for this group of MDES students that started over a year and a half ago uh, with the distinct topic of equity and access to food systems. So tonight's uh, uh, culminating public talk of what's on your plate is an important milestone towards the completion of their Master of Design degree. If you're not familiar with the MDES program, I would strongly encourage you to visit our website at stamps.umich.edu and learn more about this unique integrative design program. Before um, I go any further, I'd like to um, do a land acknowledgement, which is important for us to, to think about and do. Uh, the team thought it was important for us to do this. So, the University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Wyandotte, Seneca, Delaware, Shawnee, Miami, Sauk, and Fox, and others. In 1817, the Potawatomi Ottawa Ojibwe nations made the largest single gift to the early university when they granted land through the Article 16 of the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids so that their children could be educated. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land, sovereignty, and their contributions to the university are recognized and reaffirmed. Thank you to uh, Dr. Lisa Young for getting that acknowledgement together for us. Okay, so tonight's itinerary is as follows. Um, I'm gonna provide just a little bit of context about the problem of equity and access in food systems. And then each of the three candidates are going to present their thesis work. We'll have uh, about 15, maybe 20 minutes each uh, after their presentation to engage them in questions. And then at the end of the third presentation, we're gonna gather here together around the table and have a bit of a group discussion about integrative design, wicked problems, uh, and the nature of, of food systems in general. So food, wh why, why are we focusing on this? Equity and access in food systems is so important. Not only does food sustain us, it helps define our culture. Learning to foster and facilitate its growth and share in its bounty is an important part of our humanity. A simple meal can lead us to the doorstep of engaging deeper issues, such as labor practices, official food policy, access to land, access to healthy seed stock, capital, not to mention access to clean, reliable water, and energy and access to the food itself. Food issues allow us to dig deeper into multiple aspects of sustainability, regenerative practice, and justice. The ongoing chronic issue of climate change and the acute problems of COVID uh, add to the wickedness of this problem of equity and access to food systems. Even still, their rewarding work uh, with empathizing with other humans, plants, and animals. This opens the door to a deeper connection and understanding of care. Care for the soil, the water, the air, other living things, including our human brothers and sisters. It's a pathway to building strength and creative practice and leadership. Personally, I live and work on a farm and I love working in the food system. I love the iterative nature of the design work. No doubt there are many significant challenges to improving our contemporary food systems, but there is good news. One of the best things that's happened is we have three people that have dedicated the past two years of their education to thinking about how do we improve the food system. There's also great space in food systems to think about solace and healing. 
there's ways to find beauty and even joy. Right now on my farm, there's 35 lambs bouncing around and it's hard to look away in the spring because it's such a beautiful sight. In sum, it's a perfect space uh, to nurture both scholarship and leadership hand in hand to literally build a more inclusive, just and sustainable future. Just about uh, two years ago in this very space, we're, we're talking to you from the MDES studios on North Campus in the University of Michigan here in Ann Arbor. Uh, we talked about what it means to be on a team at Michigan and talked about Bo Schembechler's famous speech about the team, the team, the team, and how we're stronger working with other humans. And coming together, uh, we can get further on projects uh, than if we worked in isolation. So we started out this journey uh, about a year and a half ago by partnering with uh, Michigan Dining here at the university to help them advance their understanding of how implementing a, a program called Sustainable Monday, which is a variant of Meatless Monday, uh, is pushing the mission of reducing our carbon footprint at the university forward. During the winter term of last year, we also partnered with uh, the, the farm at St. Joseph's Hospital in Ypsilanti and did some important work uh, with a high tunnel, a, a hoop house, a greenhouse that they used for occupational therapy and physical therapy and were able to execute some design work there as a team. Then over the summer, the students were able to pivot into their own individual research and move on their thesis projects. And that's where we are tonight. So each of the students will now begin to present their uh, a summary of uh, their question, the work that they've moved forward on, uh, and I hope we can all engage uh, in meaningful conversation with them. So our first presenter tonight is Najwa Rehman. He is a designer with a background in branding, graphic design, and fiction. His current work focuses on climate change and food security in Pakistan. So take it away, Naj. Thank you, Joe. Um, <clears throat> I'll just go ahead and do that screen sharing thing. Moment. Okay, I've lost the Zoom window. Hold on, found it. All right, can you see my slide check? Looks good. Cool, and you cannot see my notes because you're not supposed to see those. Correct. Cool. All right, thank you so much. Wait, can you see me? Sorry, hold on. Okay, you can see me as well. I mean, by this time I should know Zoom, like the back of my hand, but no. All right, I'll get started now. Thank you so much everyone for joining and thank you uh, Joe for introducing us and introducing me. So, okay. so I realized that for most of my presentation, I'll be a tiny little box in some corner of your screen. So I decided that I'll take a few moments uh, just to quickly, briefly, briefly introduce myself and my work in addition to what Joe said. Um, so I'm Najwa, I come from Pakistan and I have a background as Joe mentioned in business branding, graphic design and fiction. And over the past few years, I've engaged deeply with food systems and integrative design and issues of equity and access in that area. And today I'll be sharing my work um, that I've done on my thesis. And my project is called On the Same Map. On the Same Map, um, engages Giga mapping as a strategic tool to help researchers support Pakistan's policy response to, it, to its climate change induced food security vulnerabilities. Now there's a bunch of uh, terms here, Giga mapping, um, Pakistan's food security vulnerabilities. Um, so I'll talk about all of these and contextualize over the course of my presentation. So first step uh, that I took over, um, so I started working on my thesis in earnest last summer and the first step was really defining the problem. So I discovered that Pakistan is the fifth most vulnerable country to the long-term impacts of anthropogenic climate change. 
Uh, rising temperatures, melting glaciers, disastrous floods, and erratic rainfall have already ravaged the country socially, economically, and ecologically. But in addition to other impacts of climate change, uh, climate change also threatens Pakistan's food security, declining crop yields, uh, due to high temperatures, warming seas leading to declining fishery production, um, lower milk production, and extreme weather events like last spring's locust attacks are just some of the things that um, are just some of the ways in which climate change is threatening Pakistan's food security. And this will only get worse with a rising population and inaction on the part of the global community, as well as Pakistan's own um, policy inefficiencies. Before we go any further, I'd like to quickly um, talk about what really food security is. Food security is a situation that exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active, active and healthy life. So there's a lot that goes into food, uh, food security. Further on, food security has four pillars. Um, availability, which means if food is actually, you know, available, can, does food exist? Accessibility, food might exist, but is it you know, affordable or is it physically accessible? For example, in, in, in events of natural disasters, people might not have access, physical access to food. Utilization, which refers to you might have food, but that food might not actually meet your you know, nutrition needs. It might not be safe, um, so utilization. And finally, stability, which really deals with uh, the stability of all, all of the other factors uh, is, you know, food uh, availability erratic or is the price too volatile, etc. So these are the four uh, components that make up food security. And my project deals with the fourth one, the pink one, stability, which is um, also the one that is impacted by climate change because climate change impacts agriculture. So food security is a prominent topic in key government and strategy documents and statements in Pakistan. Uh, we have a dedicated food security ministry and also a policy that was drafted in 2018, fairly recent. Um, the policy repeatedly highlights the importance of coordination and linkages between different stakeholders in the sector. And this is an idea that is further um, highlighted by the prime minister himself and leading experts such as Dr. Slary. So this idea that we need better linkages and better coordination between different actors such as researchers and academia and um, funders, donors, and uh, different government organizations. However, our research has told us that uh, there are gaps in the strategy and its implementation. These uh, linkages are either not there or are ineffective. So I discovered this and then I sort of wondered how can integrative design help us um, make a positive contribution to this problem space? How could we work with researchers in, in, this, in, the, in the case of this project, how could we work with researchers to try and support Pakistan's policy response to its uh, food security vulnerabilities arising from climate change. So I went ahead and looked at really the landscape and I found people um, that I want to work with. Uh, and th these are my partners and stakeholders. My key partner is Anna Ejaz, who is a research, food security researcher based in Islamabad, Pakistan. In addition to Amna, I have a research network of uh, uh, people, researchers and government representatives that I have been working very closely with over the past several months. Uh, and finally, my stakeholders are again, uh, researchers working in the food security and climate change sector in Pakistan. So I, as I worked uh, with these people and as I read about this problem space, uh, I sort of pieced together this picture of um, this landscape being very complex, many different actors and and many different flows between these actors. So we realized that this is a really complex, wicked problem space. And this was just exciting um, getting to work on it. So that led to um, our research question, which is how can collaborative and interactive giga mapping help researchers make sense of the complex landscape uh, of stakeholders in the food security and climate change sector in Pakistan? Uh, this was a re uh, research question. And to explore this question, we launched our research phase one, which was understanding the problem space further. In this phase, we did uh, several interviews and informal conversations. We did one design charrette, and based off of that design charrette, we did several one-on-one -on -one generative design sessions. 
And through these interviews and sessions, we sort of uh, started piecing together um, a narrative of what this landscape really looks like. And these are some quotes from our participants. And uh, uh, the narrative that we started to see emerge uh, was um, this idea of many different policies, many different acts, uh, many different actors, but a lot of confusion and, and a very difficult to navigate landscape. Um, for example, uh, this orange one highlights the 18th amendment, which is a piece of legislation that was passed in 2010 that devolves certain powers from the federal government to the provincial government, uh, especially in the areas of agriculture and health. And so that, that's just one example of, and it's fairly recent and um, researchers working in this area have, have a really hard time understanding how this impacts their work and how this impacts you know, different, um, the working of different uh, government units. So the overall picture that we were getting was this, it's a really complex problem space that uh, even people working within don't really have, um, have a comprehensive understanding of. So we had this narrative evidence, but we decided that uh, we could also sort of build on this um, narrative evidence through some uh, visual um, evidence. So that led us to our first design charrette um, last fall. We did a design charrette with researchers and government representatives. Um, so this is a snapshot of that uh, charrette board and everything was done virtually over Zoom and this is mural. And the main activity in this design charrette was creating um, stakeholder maps. So we asked all of our participants to make stakeholder maps of the present and the future. And this is one of the participants actually making one of those maps. And we also used, um, yeah, so we also used design fictions, which are narratives from the future. We made um, these, so we made this uh, fake newspaper story, Dawn is the newspaper of record in Pakistan. We made this fake story about um, a very, very favorable future from the year 2030 when Pakistan has done really well in food security. So we use this to sort of um, encourage, the parts, uh, encourage the participants to think um, generatively and uh, think about the future and how, uh, think about ways in, in which we could actually arrive at this future. So this was a design charrette and the, main, and the main outcome of this design charrette were these maps. And this was really interesting because all of these maps looked very different. Uh, they revealed many different actors. So for, um, government representatives had a very different view of the space, Research, researchers had a different view, um, people coming from donor agencies had a, very, had a very different view. So this sort of solidified our earlier narrative of uh, this, this, this space with many different ways of looking at it and different people having different um, perspectives of it. And through all of this process, throughout the first research phase, we were piecing together this picture of immense complexity. And at this point, we sort of took a pause and because we had uh, gathered a lot of data, a lot of interviews and this, um, the, this visual data from our charrette. So we took a pause and um, tried to sort of work through all of the insights that, insights that we had generated. And at this point, we transitioned into um, the second phase of our research, which was getting on the same map. So in the first phase, we, we you know, came across numerous apparent op opportunities for design interventions. For example, uh, research communication was, was an opportunity um, there was clarifying the role of the 18th Amendment and facilitating better linkages, uh, linkages between different stakeholders. So we all of um, all of these design opportunities sort of uh, presented uh, themselves, but we realized that before we could sort of jump at uh, jump in and do like a design project, uh, quote unquote design project, uh, we had to really um, understand the problem space better. So we decided to actually make it explicit. We um, uh, referenced Ezio Manzini, a renowned design scholar, who says that designers can contribute to making ecosystems more ready for active, collaborative, and sustainable behavior, not by changing the state of things, but by making them visible first. So we realized what we had to do was to make things visible and tangible. And in this case, this thing that we wanted to make visible and tangible was really this entire 
landscape and network of actors and their flows in the food security and climate change decision making landscape in Pakistan. Um, before we started doing this, though, we actually looked at existing work in this space and we realized that um, researchers have already done something along uh, the same lines. So net maps. Net maps are complex in depth mapping of interactions and relationships. And this is uh, a design method that is actually developed by food security researchers. Um, this is um, from 2007, so it's still um, fairly new and developed by um, a researcher at this organization, IFPRI, um, which is a leading uh, research organization in food security research. So net maps can help users understand the flows of knowledge and the formal and informal ways in which policy decisions are made. And we realized that this is exactly our intention as well. We also wanted to understand this landscape and this network of how actors interacted and who really the actors even were. So this is an example of a net map. Uh, this is from 2013. And uh, this answers the question, um, who influences agriculture water management policy at the national level in Pakistan? And the different sort of connections between these and these different uh, actors and stakeholders, these are the different links, who has formal oversight, who provides funding, who provides technical knowledge or advice and who pressures whom or you know, who has informal influence. So we looked at these maps and we realized that these maps had really rich, relevant um, knowledge and insights within them, but we also op uh, um, found an opportunity. While these net maps offer rich and relevant information, uh, the way they are ultimately presented in, you know, as part of uh, papers, and this is um, this one really is the final outcome of the net map. So we realized that there was an opportunity to to and do it in a different way um, because our researchers, our, our research participants told us that it was rather difficult to get much out of these net maps. Enter giga mapping. Uh, we realized that giga mapping might be uh, uh, might be a relevant um, way to address this problem space and to understand this this space. Giga mapping is a technique to map out, contextualize, and relate complex systems, the environment, and bigger landscape, their current state, as well as preferred future states. Uh, essentially, this is a way of mapping out really complex social technical systems. And so this is an example of a giga map. And giga maps are these deliciously detailed complex maps that uh, lay out complex uh, social technical spaces. Um, this one is actually sort of a meta map, and this maps out different types of systemic relations. Um, you know, th there are many different kinds, for example, thematic relations and re representational relations, associative relations. And uh, so, yeah, if, if you look at the deal ones, for example, these are the thematic relations, for example, e ecology is thematically related to agroecology and biology, et cetera. So this, that's just one example of a giga map. Uh, this is another example that maps out the obesity epidemic, and this comes from a group of students at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so, sort of zooming in, um, it this map uh, highlights the positive feedback loops that um, contribute to the problem of um, the obesity epidemic. At the same time, it uh, highlights some interventions that can lead to solving the problem. So we realized that Giga maps with their immense complexity uh, were really well suited to, uh, to this problem space that we were dealing with. Another opportunity within Giga maps were to make them interactive because Giga maps by definition are these really complex, really detailed maps. And uh, Brigger Severson, who is a Norwegian professor and who is actually the pioneer of Giga mapping, uh, highlight, um, highlights this opportunity opportunity to make them interactive in um, in his 2011 paper. So we realized that we could use giga mapping, building on net maps, and then also make giga maps interactive, um, and that could be a great way to understand the problem space. So we went about uh, doing that. We did another charrette, which is the around the world charrette. I call it the around the world charrette because we had people from Vancouver all the way to Australia, and we. Um, 
uh, we did another mapping activity. This time uh, we had a specific problem that we were trying to map. This was science communication uh, in this landscape. Uh, earlier, uh, in the earlier charrette, we sort of had looked at the broader um, overall landscape of who all the actors were. But in this case, we were uh, looking at a very specific problem. Um, we also used uh, mapping as a design inquiry as well as the artifact. So the process of making maps led to um, insights and, and ideas as well as the map itself was a design artifact that could lead to further insights. Um, so uh, one of our participants, uh, we, we got really favorable, feed, favorable feedback and this is a quote from one of the participants. I think this exercise is very valuable because when you see the arrows and flows, you realize where things are not flowing and should flow. So up until this point, we had been gathering a lot of data and trying to understand the problem space. And now I will share the design outcomes that came out of this intensive research uh, process. So we made prototypes of maps. This is a very early prototype um, that we made after uh, our first charrette. And I'll just play it, it's, it's a video actually. So on the left, you see these different levels. So we, um, if you click, for example, on the provincial level, um, the federal level is sort of filtered out. And you can also um, highlight different kinds of actors. If you click on the federal government, uh, federal government actors are highlighted for you. And you can also highlight uh, different kinds of flows. So if you click on funding, funding flows are highlighted. So this was really the proof of concept prototype that we did super early. And then we tested this uh, with our research participants. And here's um, some quotes um, on the prototype. Uh, so I like this idea, something like this would have been useful in trying to understand the fertilizer gas subsidy landscape. Uh, one of our participants told us, giving a very specific example of the work she had done. Uh, we also had uh, feedback on the first version. Um, our participants told us that it would be useful to have search functionality, uh, labels for actors and contextual information for flows. And we incorporated that into the second prototype. And in this, we try to make it more user friendly. So you can still highlight the different actors, you can highlight different flows. Um, yeah, so these different flows and you can also filter out different levels, provincial or federal level. Um, then you also have labels. You can turn label, labels on or off. You can also search for um, different actors. And finally, you can um, zoom in and out. And you can also get contextual information about uh, different actors. So this was a second prototype that we built. Um, and by this time, we uh, started getting a more um, specific kind of uh, specific feedback about the kind of audience that this could be useful for, which was someone who doesn't know a lot about these things. And um, th this could get to get them up to speed pretty quickly. So people who were working, who were new to the Pakistan uh, landscape or who were new to a specific topic within Pakistan. So we had feedback on this uh, prototype as well. Um, people asked us to, uh, one important thing was to create specific maps for specific issues and provide external links and attach relevant policies and to different actors and distinguish actors through different icons. And this is the current prototype that uh, we're at this stage, it's not complete, but it, um, so this one is actually uh, the map that we got in the second charrette and this maps out research communication within this, uh, within this landscape. So this is a prototype that we're working on right now. And here's another quote from uh, one of our participants. Again, uh, following the same theme that uh, someone who's new to this space could be really useful for, for them. All right, uh, we, have, we have more feedback that we're working on uh, right now, um, for example, the ability to have keep multiple filters on or to turn off um, specific parts of the map. 
Uh, as I said, um, we realized that there's a very specific audience that this, school, this tool could be very useful for, uh, people who are new to this space. And uh, yeah, I also realized I'm running out of time, so I'll just quickly run through the rest of my presentation. So what I learned, a brief taking from what I actually learned, I did these online, um, my entire project has been online and virtual. And I, um, so these charrettes also were virtual. So there was a lot of learning in that, um, how to effectively run charrettes online. Uh, I became a lot more uh, comfortable with complexity, which was not the case a year ago. Um, so working within this space and working with Giga Maps and trying to map out these complex systems, um, this was really important to me because designers sometimes tend to demonize complexity and try to sort of fix it with uh, simple solutions. And I realized that complexity is, is important and, and I've learned to embrace it actually. And finally, Giga Mapping is a powerful and accessible method of design inquiry. Uh, I think this is my second last section. I'll just take one more minute. So contribution and impact. Um, these maps can help researchers make sense of the problem space and to situate themselves within it and identify opportunities for interventions. Um, maths, I believe, is an amazing uh, way to um, deal with and understand complex, wicked problem spaces. And I think this, is, um, and this can enrich the integrative design toolkit. Um, and finally, it can also, uh, the government of Pakistan is working on different uh, digital tools and uh, portals and uh, also the policy itself talks about um, building better connections and this can um, help support those, uh, that strategy. Um, and finally, the future work. Uh, I'm working on a Giga mapping toolkit for researchers because so far I've been um, facilitating this process. So I want to be able, uh, I want research to, researchers to be able to do this on their own. So I'm building a toolkit, um, as I said, working with the government to actually uh, make a digital platform. This is much farther into the future, but this is a possibility. And finally, through these maps, identifying opportunities for um, design interventions, because up until now, we have been picturing the landscape and laying out the landscape. And the next step is to actually figure out what design opportunity, opportunities might be there. So I have a few more slides, but I'll just finish here. I'm at 25 minutes. Uh, just a bunch of thank yous. This is a long list, um, but yeah, thank you for a lot of, and to a lot of people who have helped throughout this process. And yeah, that's it. Thank you and questions. Great, thank uh, you, Naj. Yeah, the floor is open for people to unmute themselves and engage Naj in some questions. There's something in the chat, are those questions? Um, hi, Naj, thank you. Hi. For a great presentation. Um, I was wondering, as a designer, how did you navigate working with and facilitating these design sessions with experts um, in like the different complex technical topics that you did with climate change and uh, food security, um, areas that you're pretty new to? Yeah, I think um... Absolutely. That was a struggle in the beginning, I think. Um, and I was concerned about that um, uh, ab around the time of the first charrette, because that was where I was really facilitating a group of people and a group of experts, really. And I think by that time, I had done a lot of reading and I had, spoke, I had spoken to a lot of people in this space. So I think by that time, I had sort of picked up uh, a lot of language and vocabulary. So I I could kind of pass off as, you know, seeing like I knew what I was talking about. So I had that vocabulary and I didn't know about the problem space at, at, at that point. Um, also, I think um, I was very honest um, about my intentions and I, I laid out that I'm a design student and I don't really know this problem space as well as you do, obviously. And I am a facilitator. So I'm not here to, you know, 
tell you how I will solve this problem or offer any solutions. I'm just facilitating this knowledge transfer. So I think um, setting the expectation and framing my role was, was important. And people generally were really helpful and supportive in, in doing that. So yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'd like to ask a question if I might. Uh, this is Brad Smith, is one of the STEMS faculty members. I appreciate the, the uh, presentation and congratulations on the, the good work that you've done. Um, I was intrigued by the, your comments about GigaMaps and recognizing that um, they seem to serve two purposes. Um, I'm going to use my own words for it. It seems that they, in one sense, could reveal or discover relationships. That is, they could be used as a probe, a research tool to probe and um, uh, make discoveries or uh, unveil something that was not known before. Or they could act as, uh, you call them artifacts. I would say that they perhaps are a means of communicating discoveries that have already taken place. And so I appreciate that you acknowledge that. I'd like to push it a little bit further because you later followed up and suggested that these gigamaps tended to be, and I think this came up multiple times, were useful for, and I think your words were someone um, who knows the space. And so I'm curious, could you talk a little bit more about if they're really most useful for someone who knows the space, are they serving more a communication um, purpose or a discovery and research purpose? What's your, what's your prediction and observation? Yeah, it's really interesting because um, so this insight that this could be useful for people who are actually new to this space. Um, uh, so that was um, multiple people uh, said that to the prototypes that this would be super useful for someone who is either um, new to a topic or new to Pakistan. And that's something that I was not thinking. I thought this could be useful for any researcher. Um, so um, I'm sorry, what was your question, I started commenting yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, so, so I'm curious, um, do you see them as being more important or valuable as probes to investigate where something's not yet known or to communicate to a novice things that are known but are perhaps complicated? Um, I think it's actually both. And this is what I learned in the second shred actually, um, because we had people who were experienced researchers in the second shred who were making these maps. And through this process, they were gathering insights that, okay, you know, this actor is not well connected. So even though they had years, multiple years of experience, I would say like even decades of experience, they were discovering these insights. But at the same time, um, one quote was that, uh, one of the participants said that, what I learned in 10 years, I, seven years, what I learned in seven years, I could learn, you know, in a maybe an hour just engaging with this map. So in that case, the map is this artifact, but they were also making the maps and gathering these insights while making the map, even though they were you know, experienced in, in this problem space. Thank you. Jennifer has her hand up. Yes, Jennifer, I think we can. Uh Hi, everyone. Um, such a great talk. Thank you. Um, I'm just so impressed with um, the work that you're doing um, for the food security situation, but also by all the design contributions that are being made along the way as you make your discoveries, um, whether it comes down to the different methodologies you've been using that I think are really revolutionary and, and I'm excited to hear about. But I, what one of them would be um, you're working with so many people and um, you're doing this all virtually. Is there anything you've learned in terms of just how to do design work right now um, virtually with others and, and collaborate with your stakeholders? Yeah, uh, so when I started working on this project uh, last summer, I was actually really excited about the opportunity of uh, doing this virtually because that meant that I could um, work in Pakistan that uh, and that's something that I really wanted to do. Um, so I was really excited. And uh, for the most part, it's been really great actually doing this online because as I spoke about the second charrette, um, you know, we had people from Australia all the way to Canada, which would not have been possible at all in, in, in an in-person setting. Also, I think I, I, just, I was able to uh, 
uh, access people a lot more because you know it's just easier to get onto a Zoom call. Um, that would have been difficult uh, with like an in-person thing. At the same time, though, I, I did feel that some of the design activities in the charrettes, for example, were constrained by the digital nature, virtual nature, because um, a few people in the first charrette, especially a few people uh, struggled with technology and uh, that did uh, affect the quality of the charrette, I would say. And generally the kind of activities that we had, I think um, those might have been um, even more engaging if you know we were doing those with paper and color pencils, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's also important to recognize that our world is very different now and might be very different for the foreseeable future. So I think it's, it's, it was important, uh, looking back, I think it was important to, to, to have learned these lessons and to have done this research in, in this format. Um, so yeah, to, to, to summarize, it was, it was a mixed bag. Uh, there, was, there were opportunities, but there were also challenges. Overall, I think, uh, I, I, I think it was good that, that there was virtual. I think we have time left for one more question. I, I would like to ask you, Naj, if that's possible. Um, um, uh, Burger Sivelson um, in his paper, Gigamax, talks about uh, combining, interpolating, and criticizing system models. And thinking about some of your earlier work uh, in the design fiction, um, thinking how that flows through, because what you presented seemed uh, very much more pragmatic. And I wonder if the critical part of it is still part of the project. Yeah, so um, my project has evolved a lot. And I, I mean, I'm sure you can sort of tell uh, it's, it's different from what it was in December. Uh, back then, I was a lot more interested in uh, design fiction and speculative design. But I spoke about this this moment where you know I took a pause and before jumping into design, uh, before jumping into a design project, uh, I realized that what was needed was to actually map it out. And that's when I sort of uh, started going into this direction of systemic design and system mapping. Uh, so I think um, Sevelson also says that uh, giga mapping is pretty uh, non-dogmatic and it's also a fairly recent, uh, uh, it's, it's a developing field. So I think it has space for different kinds of inquiry and uh, I use design fiction, critical design, uh, speculative design in the early, earlier part of the project that I think there is space for those different kinds of inquiry in in um, in a giga mapping project, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I think to again to circle back to your question, um, I think I, I see that as a whole, my project, and I see like the earlier parts of my project contributing to how the giga map uh, came together. And I, I don't necessarily see that there's a uh, there's a disconnect between the earlier approach or, or the later approach. Great. Thank you so much, Naj. Great work. Well done. Next up, we have Laurie Young. Laurie earned her BA and BFA in fashion design and textile design from Indiana University. She then went on to start her own studio, working with clients on social missions, including nonprofits, startups, and governmental organizations. She quickly found that she was designing in new ways and decided to head back to school. That letter here to the MDES Integrative Design Program. Lori. Thank you, Joe. So in an effort to do something a little bit different than the traditional Zoom talk, I have pre-recorded my talk as a video and Megan is gonna go ahead and play that for us now. And we'll keep our fingers crossed that it streams properly. Hi, my name is Laria Young, and I'm a designer and illustrator working on creating the future equitable and sustainable food systems. I'm a current graduate student in the University of Michigan Integrative Design Master's Program. Now, I come from a fine arts background, but quickly found myself working in a diversity of design fields from medical products to costume design. 
And it was actually while working as a costume designer and supervisor at a local high school that I found a passion for empowering students to see themselves as designers. So when I got to the University of Michigan, I knew I wanted to continue working with high school students. And since I was working on food systems, I realized the logical place to start was in school cafeterias. It quickly became apparent that cafeterias play a really important role in our food system and the well-being of our society as a whole. Right now, there are over 15 million students enrolled in high schools across the country. And for many of them, cafeterias are the place where they will build relationships with food and their peers that will last a lifetime. In fact, over 30 million lunches are served each day just through the National School Lunch Program. And changes in this space have an incredible impact on not just the health and well being of our students, but also the planet. In a two year long pilot project by the Oakland School District of California, through simple changes to their menu, like replacing animal products with protein rich legumes, they were able to save millions of gallons of water and reduce their carbon footprint, all while saving money. And studies show that increasing the availability and consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables in cafeterias can significantly decrease the rates of student obesity and lower the chance of developing chronic health conditions like type 2 diabetes and heart disease later in life. These are the number one killers in our country. And these same chronic health conditions disproportionately affect people of color who are also more likely to participate in programs like the National School Lunch Program as students. So talking about the design of cafeteria spaces is more than an aesthetics issue, more than an environmental issue, more than a health issue. It is the critical equity issue that we need to address in the 21st century. And it is time to stop thinking that providing food of any kind in any environment is good enough. In the words of chef and activist Alice Waters, if we change the criteria for purchasing all food in public schools and buy directly from the farmers and ranchers that are caring for the land regeneratively, we will address climate change and teach the next generation the values of nourishment, stewardship, and community. So in my first semester in the program, I decided I wanted to talk to these students about their cafeterias. And I was gifted the opportunity to conduct a small design research project at a high school here in Ann Arbor. So I created a short survey asking questions like, what is your definition of healthy food? How do you learn about food? How do you decide what to eat, et cetera? I also gave them a week long food diary and almost as an afterthought, created a five to 10 minute long creative activity where I asked the students to design their ideal cafeteria. Now I had some preconceived notions about what these students would say. I thought maybe they would either not be interested at all or would maybe just say that they wanted more pizza or something like that. But what I actually got back from the students really shocked me. These students were thinking about issues like how the food they ate impacted themselves, their community and the planet, along with issues of socioeconomic status, stigmatization of students on free and reduced lunch, and creating better, more inclusive social environments. Here are a few examples where one student is ideating ways to use technology to create a better experience for students with diet preferences and restrictions. One who is designing cooking options for low income students so that they can prepare warm meals at school with food they brought from home. And one who is exploring ways to connect food with other students interests such as gaming. So this really got me wondering if these students are the main stakeholders in cafeterias and are not only thinking about these issues, but are clearly more, more than capable of ideating solutions and improvements. Are we including them in conversations about the development of these spaces? So I started doing some research and what I found is the simple answer is no. High school students felt their opinions, ideas and experiences were being ignored and they were eager for an opportunity to share or even take action. I also found that while there were absolutely incredible programs out there working to improve our cafeterias, very few of them operated at the high school level. The majority of these programs tended to still remove students from the decision making process and prioritized individual health food choices, which is most often measured by the increased consumption of fruits and vegetables over all other aspects of the cafeteria, such as food equity and access and food systems education. I found this problematic as high schoolers are at a critical point in their development where they're actively building identities around food that are separate from that of their parents and guardians. And many are preparing to leave home and become responsible for their own food choices and access. Not implementing these positive changes in high school cafeterias represents a missed opportunity to empower the next generation to become informed participants in our food systems. Last but not least, 
I'm sorry. Studies have shown that changes to the cafeteria are most successful when the student body is involved. And that students learn not when they are being nudged into different choices, as we say in the design world, but when they become active participants in the process. So this led me to my guiding research questions. How can high school students become an active voice in designing an equitable and sustainable cafeteria of the future? And how can we make this design process empowering so that students view themselves as change agents in their food systems? Now you just heard me use that word empowerment again. Empowerment has become a key metric for my success as a designer. And as designers, we love this word. We often tout it as a goal for our projects, especially when they involve community engagement. But this got me wondering, what does it actually mean and how are we measuring it? Luckily, there's an entire field of research into what is now called empowerment theory. And one of the pioneers of this work is right here at the University of Michigan, Professor Mark Zimmerman. And not only has Mark defined empowerment as when a person believes that he or she is capable of influencing a given context, understands how the system works in that context and engages in behaviors designed to exert control over that context. He has also created proven tools for measuring empowerment in students through this amazing program, Youth Empowerment Solutions. So then I looked back at my own field to explore what approach I would use to implement empowerment theory into my own work. And this led me to two related design processes, co-design or co-creation and dialogic design. These describe a design approach where stakeholders, including the design expert, engage in a social conversation where everyone is allowed to bring ideas and take action to achieve collaborative outcomes. Key to this is the idea that not all stakeholders will agree and therefore must actively listen and maintain an open mind. With this knowledge, I created a model to guide my current thesis work, and I call this model dialogic design empowerment. Here, wicked problems are tackled through the process of setting and achieving long-term goals to create positive change. These long-term goals are guided by the preferable futures generated through an ongoing dialogue between students and decision makers and cafeteria systems. The designer or the design process facilitates the flow of information and structure to students and values and ideas to decision makers. Following Zimmerman's definition of empowerment, the process should teach students how to understand the systems that affect them within the wicked problem space, demonstrate, demonstrate through a dialogue with decision makers that they are capable of making change within that space and create a path for students to affect change. My thesis work focuses on the student side of this model and creating tools to form the bridge between students and decision makers. So now that I had my area of focus, my research questions and a framework to guide me, I was ready to jump into the design process. And this was broken down into four stages, project definition, design research and ideation, making and testing and evaluation. The project definition stage began with a literature review of the history of cafeterias and the programs that operate within these spaces. I also began conducting interviews with a wide range of stakeholders from state level education officials to food service providers to curriculum developers. During this stage, I was introduced to my partner, Catherine Salduti, president and founder of EduChange. EduChange has been revolutionizing high school and adult education curriculum for over 20 years and is uniquely focused on teaching with an equity lens and providing STEM education tools that are contextual, integrated and project based. EduChange and Catherine are an ideal partner for this research for several reasons. One, they are leveraging design and systems thinking as tools to both develop and modify their curriculums as well as a pedagogical approach. Two, their science curriculum is integrative and features programs on food, nutrition, and fitness. And three, they are invested in changing the paradigm of high school education to help students become better learners, thinkers, designers, and doers. During my interview with experts working in government and food service, I gained several key insights. The decision-making process is very separated from students. COVID-19 has prompted food providers to engage with students in new ways. Food providers want more ways to engage with students as a whole. And school admin often feels that they don't have control over the cafeteria space. Most importantly, I learned that the magic happens when food providers, school staff, and students can align. From curriculum developers, I learned that this work should take a systems approach over an individual approach, be connected to national standards, and should focus on project-based learning approaches. And I also gained an understanding of some of the challenges involved with working on student-led programs and in cafeteria spaces. 
In addition, I was introduced to Food Corps, our cafeteria program and the edible schoolyard curriculum. These two groups are revolutionizing how we educate our students about food and along with youth empowerment solutions has served as a foundation and jumping off point throughout my thesis work. Through this process, I also found that it was difficult to talk about cafeterias to people who didn't work directly with them. When I say the word cafeteria, people most often think of two things, a room where students eat and the food that's served there. And while these are both very important aspects, they are only part of a very complex picture. I needed a visual tool to quickly communicate the complexity and interconnectedness of cafeterias. So I decided to create a cafeteria systems map and an associated icon set. This map is broken into four areas, food, policy, place, and community, and lists some of the elements that exist within each of those areas. As my research progressed, this tool became foundational to generating ideas and goals with students and to the design of my final project outcome. With these insights in hand, I went back to my research questions. How can high school students become an active voice in designing an equitable and sustainable cafeteria of the future? And how can we make this design process empowering so that students view themselves as change agents in their food systems? To answer this, I decided to create a process that would position students as designers and guide them through generating ideas and visions for the future of their cafeteria so that these could be shared with decision makers. In stage two, design research and ideation, I was ready to start working hands-on with students to generate these ideas and find out what do students actually wanna see in their cafeterias and how do they wanna be involved in this change? So I designed a co-creation workshop that students could engage with online through Zoom and a visual tool called Mural and conducted over 20 over the course of two months. The workshop was broken into two parts. First, a 30 minute interview where I asked them questions about their cafeterias, food choices and interactions with school staff and then read them a future scenario where they had been asked to join a task force to make recommendations to the school administration that would guide the cafeteria development over the next 10 years. They were first asked to create a visual map of their cafeteria, then discuss the impacts of COVID before ideating their recommendations for the future of the four cafeteria sections. Through this research process, I came to two conclusions regarding my final project outcome. One, I didn't feel like it was enough to stop this work after 20 students. This was an ongoing process that should be available to all students who wanna share their voice. And two, what students care about varies wildly. So any tools used to generate ideas really needed to be flexible. From these workshops, I extracted 14 student-generated goals that would serve as long-term guides for cafeteria development and for this ongoing co-creation process with students. But I still needed a way for this process to continue on after my workshops ended. And this led me to the creation of the Lunch Club. The Lunch Club is a platform that guides high school students through the design process of identifying, refining, and sharing their visions for equitable and sustainable change in their cafeterias. The platform leverages empowerment theory and a project-based learning framework to empower students to take on the role of designers and view themselves as change agents of their environment. Built in WordPress and using a custom learning management system, the platform is free and accessible to all students who wish to participate. It is designed for students to engage with at their own pace over the course of an academic semester or trimester, in addition to or in conjunction with their school curriculum, and aligns with national standards. The platform walks students through taking on the role of a designer and identifying their values, a discovery phase where they explore and map their cafeteria, an ideation phase where they generate and refine a design vision for the future of their cafeteria, and finally, a sharing and collaboration phase where they communicate their vision and explore how it could be realized. They are given tools along the way that can be engaged with physically through a toolkit they can request in the mail, digitally, or using printed sheets and available materials. Three examples of these tools are an idea generation card game inspired by Situation Labs, a thing from the future, a layered cafeteria mapping activity, and a co-creation board that allows students to work collaboratively with decision makers. These tools and others that have been created through this research and development process will be available on the platform for anyone who wishes to use them. Over the next month, I will be refining the platform using feedback from stakeholders so that it will be ready to be piloted at schools in the fall. There is still a lot of work to be done in this space. COVID has created a disruption in our food systems that has shown many of their weaknesses and inequities. 
and provided an opportunity for us to address them. There needs to be more ways to share voices of those who've been ignored and to create these opportunities to connect our food providers, our decision makers, and our students. In closing, I would like to share a quote from Food Corps Reimagining Cafeteria Project. What if we treated school food not as a cost center to be minimized, but as a value center to be leveraged? What if school food could show us the future where every child gets the nourishment they need to thrive? What if it could affirm children's cultures and identities and invite their agency to the table? What if it could show children they are valued and cared for in a way that food, the currency of human connection, has uniquely done for eons? Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Laria. We can take the next 10 minutes or so here for questions and conversation. Great. Yeah, and really quickly, I wanted to thank again my partner, Catherine of EduChange Inc., and my advisor, Sophia Bruckner, and Joy Nolenbloch. Hey, Laria. Hi, John. Uh, can I ask um, how the empowerment theory is playing through uh, in the, the work that you're doing to finish up your project? And uh, if, if you're using that as an evaluation tool? Yes, I am. So for one thing, it also, it helped me build out that process and think about what students needed to do along the way in order to understand the systems that they were in and then take action to exhibit some control over those systems. But um, as part of Mark Zimmerman's Youth Empowerment Solutions Program, he had developed a series of evaluation tools that they do sort of pre, during, and post. And those are built into this platform and as part of the process so that I sort of on the back end and the students themselves can evaluate how they feel about their ability to sort of have agency within these systems. Thanks. Thanks, John. Oh, Justice has his hand up. Uh, hey, Najwad and Larea, great to uh, hear your presentations. I was wondering about the element of the food that's served, and then and maybe I missed this, but also like the act of creating food or the culture of making food as an activity in that maybe came up. Um, I just wondering if you could speak to that as like an intervention or some a part of the system that often people in high school or younger are just taken out of the picture when maybe they want to be in the picture. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing that a lot of students say actually in, in a lot of the data that came back is students are really interested in incorporating cooking and food into other educational outlets. So sort of one of my my guiding um, stars for this work has been the Edible Schoolyard Project. And one of their core pieces of their curriculum is that they really do incorporate that food prep, food identity, and food cultures throughout all of the classes. So biology, chemistry, you know, history, all that sort of stuff. Um, and so it was something that, that came up a lot, the students brought up. Now, the goal of this platform is to allow students to sort of identify and develop their own visions and projects. So I'm not necessarily trying to steer them in that direction, but it definitely aligns with those goals. One of them is to connect food and education. And so my hope is as those help guide the student projects, that that will, that more students will focus on trying to build out that piece at their school, because I do think it's very important. So I think there's some chat stuff too. Laria, I see a comment in the chat. Would you like me to read it? Yeah, that would be wonderful, Megan. Okay, so Kelly says, I don't know if this is on your radar, Laria, but check out um, charliecart.org as well. It's like a next step from the Edible Schoolyard and also a project based in the Bay Area. 
i.e. how to prepare the food you once you have grown it. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Kelly, for sharing that. I don't think I'm familiar with that one, but so many of these like amazing programs right now are coming out of the Bay Area, including that one example project I shared. So I will take a look at that. Thank you. Um, hi, Laria. <clears throat> Quick question. On the platform that you designed, is there a way for students to share like what they came up with um, or like examples that students could see um, of like how you know other groups of students kind of came up with what their like cafeterias would be like and like the future of like food in schools yeah absolutely and it was kind of hard to see on the platform itself there is like an explore page um and my hope is for that to to use it as a place right now where i will sort of be doing the curation of the students projects and of the schools and share them out that way but it is definitely something I hope for with the future of this is that, you know, I can sort of facilitate some of that sharing piece between students and between schools as well. So people can see what projects are going on elsewhere because that's a part that's really missed right now is, you know, one school will do something really amazing, you know, like replace all of their disposable silverware with, you know, reusable silverware, but then none of the other schools in the area know about that. And therefore they think it's something that would be difficult or challenging or impossible for them to do. So I definitely think that's a really important piece. Hi, Laria, this is Frank. Hi, Frank. You doing? <clears throat> Thank you for your illuminating um, talk. I just wanted to bring your attention to um, British chef Jimmy Oliver. Oh yeah. There is an article I'm going to send to you um, right now, and um, it's about uh, Jimmy Oliver revolutionizing school lunches. And I think you should take a look at it because this might add some context to what you do with uh, the work that you're doing. That would be great. Thank you so much for sharing that. So it's in there for you. Great. Yeah. One of the people I talked to, um, her name's Peggy Chan, and she's doing some really interesting school lunch and program development in uh, Hong Kong. And so I'll be really interested to see what the similarities are there. I mean, this had to do with uh, healthy eating because is of the belief that uh, healthy food and uh, good food is essential to how children grow to understand um, um, how to live in this world. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's definitely been studies and it's sort of a, just a known thing that the kids learn better too when they're well fed with healthy food. So it's definitely a really important, important thing. Yeah, I mean, there are some statistics that talk about how I think in his uh, in an essay that uh, the essay that was written about his work, it says that more than 91 million school children worldwide now defines living with obesity uh, is uh, is has become some sort of pandemic, and uh, you know, I was thinking that in your work perhaps if you had to look at the hard right that we've all been forced to take in these in 2020. That could be, um, a, you know, a way to sort of uh, hang on to something that is definitely on our radar, you know, and um, using that as a way to sort of push forward this uh, very fine idea that you have. Yeah, I'll look at that. Thank you so much. You know, it's also very, very um, um, curious about what sort of instrument you used to collect uh, data or information from the students. Yeah, so I had um, a couple different things. So in the so sort of first piece of my, the project that I did last year, I used surveys, a food journal, and that sort of creative mapping activity. So I got both qualitative and quantitative data from that. And it was really helpful for me to sort of see what the students were actually eating on a daily basis. And then in sort of the second half in this semester's research, um, I focused mostly with the students on that co-creation workshop. And during that first 30 minutes, I asked them a lot of interview questions that were really specific to, 
you know, what food are you eating every day? What food is your cafeteria serving? How do you make decisions about what food choices you're making, um, whether they were at home during COVID or whether they were still um, learning in person? And then had them sort of recreate a lot of those things visually within the mural tool. So they wrote out, you know, where they got their food from, what food was being served, who was serving it to them, what they were learning in their classrooms and all that sort of stuff on that current cafeteria map that they were making. I'm just adding a second article. Oh, cool. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Gloria. Excellent work. Our last talk this evening is by Kisa V. Johnson. Kisa is an award-winning learning designer who received uh, her BA in Media and Information and a Graduate Research Certificate in Serious Game Design and Research from MSU, Michigan State University. Before coming to STAMP, she worked as a design manager for the Center of Academic Innovation, where she was creating fully online immersive courses, MOOCs, and degree programs. She decided to come to Stamps as a career change to become a full-time designer. So Kisa will now share from her computer her presentation. Kisa, it looks as though you may be muted still. All right, can everybody hear me? I think I'm getting an echo. I think we need to mute um, the, the computer there. Thank you, Laria. All right, I still hear something. It's magic. Um, okay, my, my voice sounds good though. So. <laughs> We okay? Is there another device that's logged into this Zoom room from the studios? You're looking. All right, I just muted everyone. So Kisa, go ahead and unmute yourself again. Thank you. So Kisa, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. There. Can you, it's still like that. Perhaps. Um, Hello? Kisa yeah. Hello? I don't think, I think, okay, let's do it. Sounds good. All right. Okay, so I believe in the living. I believe in the spectrum of beta days and gamma people. I believe in sunshine in windmills and waterfalls and tricycles and rocking chairs. And I believe that seeds grow into sprouts and sprouts grows into trees. And I believe in the magic of my hands and the wisdom of my eyes. I believe in rain and tears and in the blood of infinity. I believe in life. And I have seen the death parade march through the torso of the earth and sculpting mud bodies in its path. I have seen the destruction of the daylight and I've seen blessed th thirsty maggots prayed to and saluted. I have seen the kind become the blind and the blind become the bind in one easy lesson. I have walked on cut glass and I've eaten crow and blunder bread and I breathe the stench of indifference. I have been locked by the lawless and handcuffed by the haters and gagged by the greedy. And if I know one thing or anything is that a wall is just a wall and nothing more at all. And it can be broken down. And I believe in living I believe in birth and I believe in the sweat of love and in the fire truth. And I believe that lost ships steered by tired seasick sailors can still be guided home to port. 
My name is Kisa V. Johnson, and I'm a second year MDES candidate at the Penny Stamp School of Art and Design. And for the last two years, I've been studying the very wicked problem of equity and access in school systems. My thesis is called Cultivating the Mothership, Redesigning Regenerative Networks. I will walk you through my thesis quite quickly because I only have 15 minutes and my discussion flow is as follows. I'll talk about, I'll give a brief acknowledgements. I started sharing a little bit about my design philosophy and who I am. I'm here to frame the system that I'm operating in and I'm here to talk about my wonderful, wonderful community projects, which has a different creative reframing. And then I'm gonna take you to the future very quickly. So I, my acknowledgement is for the indigenous, my indigenous people, this work takes, the work that I do takes place on the Three Fire Tribe Confederacy. And um, I'm here to inspire and to be aware of the obligations to these communities and the work that I choose to do. And to my black African American people, this work is dedicated to those visionaries before, those today and the beautiful ones yet unborn. So that one day we could resist and overcome and to everybody else. If I'm not for myself, who will I be for? But if I am only for myself, what am I? I, have came, I came to design school to up my design performance level. And as Sharon Hammer talks about, I'm here to be a principled, value-driven, intuitive, and sensitive to context type individual. And if you know me, I am. I am here to talk about the rematuration of design and within the food system. Um, it is heavily baked into the Kapahi River collection. If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. The work must be organized for the collective benefit of those who do the work and create the products and not the project of the bosses. I'm here to talk about the liberation of mother earth. As Arturo Escobar says in the design of the pluriverse, but we say as long as we continue to be indigenous, in other words, children of the earth, that our mother is not currently freed for life, but she will have to when she returns to being the soil and the collective home of the people that take care of her and respect her and live with her. And as long as it's not that way, as long as we do not achieve that, our mother never recovers her freedom. Bell Hooks says that we live in an imperialistic, capitalistic, white supremacist, patriarchal system. These are interlocking systems of domination that define our global food system as well as our local. Michigan State University says that um, the food system has been shaped from its inception in racism and racism is tied to power. And what we don't understand is when we talk about systems, systems are made of people. And so how do we as people change the system that we create? Malik Yakini says that enslavement and sharecropping in the campaigns have, has put us at a loss and left us vulnerable as black people seeking for sovereign land. And so my conceptualization of an anti-Black food system, which is taken by Dr. Ashanti Reese, is that everything is based upon the intersection of the food system. And these intersections, when it comes to gender, sexuality, and race, can be often very set up very, very different based upon your geography and where you live. So my research in a nutshell, one, my first question is, how do I evaluate online food systems technology for racial and social inclusion? I have two case studies, a black urban farm producer in the city of Detroit too, and a grocery delivery pot in a low income land and community. My methods are forefronting black agrarian and indigenous perspectives where I gather data with ethnographic and focus group and survey methods to gain insight into the ecosystem of the community and the producers and the practices. I use Gender of justice as my design theory, that, that is what I've chosen to practice to analyze this data and amplify its opportunities for the circulation of unalienated value, which means extractive through web design. 
So how do I gather data from a black agrarian and indigenous perspective? How would the research that I contribute to self-empowerment or to the removal of the barriers of success for my partners? Luckily, I was able to work with three top visionaries in the food system, Peggy Von Payne, Executive Director of Northwest Initiative, Jerry Hebron, Executive Director of the North End Christian Network, and Malik Yakini, the Executive Director of the Detroit Black Food Security Network. My needle is that I was looking at the grocery delivery and the produce delivery, and I was seeing what alienated values, what extractive values are coming out from a customer side and from a farmer perspective. But COVID-19 has hit us hard. It's all hard. And for some reason, we're acting like nothing, like everything is OK. And so with Northwest Initiative, which is a 501c nonprofit organization, they had a need. And they, they approached me and I had to be too that I wanted to work with them. And so the pilot project was created to address the problem of how low income people living in lands and urban core have experienced serious barriers to food access for the past 30 years. But it was greatly amplified during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially senior citizens who utilize the EBT bridge card to purchase their groceries. The design principles that I seek to engage is positive feedback looping. So let's talk about the pilot. We started off doing some surveys, trying to talk, using the mobile food market. The mobile food market serves four community um, apartment complexes in Lansing, Michigan. I took that initial data and I started doing some secondary research with the team. And I started hearing so many stories from the seniors about how they were scared to leave, how all the activities got taken away and how they were scared to go out sometimes and get groceries. So I put together a table of collaboration. This is um, a, a methodology based upon the equity center community design. And I worked with several partners where we did some other secondary research when we looked at online grocery deliveries and we were finding loopholes in the system, loopholes in the system that didn't allow senior citizens, those, those with, disabled, with disabilities to even access the system. And there were pilot projects going on, but those pilots were short-lived. They weren't anything sustainable. And so I got with the team and we came up and started using a phone system so we can reach out to the elderly instead of having to go to them. I did took some surveys and I enlarged them and made them bigger. And we were very intentional about if there were other languages um, that people spoke in the building. I also used a graffiti board. Graffiti art is based upon hip hop culture. And so I thought that this would be an engaging activity for them to be able to share information that we weren't able to give it to, in person. I also did an experience prototype for three weeks because we were trying to see like, if we are here to do this grocery delivery pilot, then let's do some experiment. Um, with three touch points within the system, which is the intake process, the food ordering, and the food delivery. We created packets for um, the participants where they got $30, which the $30 and the money that was gave goes back into the, um, the grocery delivery pilot to keep it going. Now let's talk about D-Town Farm. And I'm speaking very quickly and I'll get to the future quite soon. Um, D-Town Farm at Oakland Avenue, I was blessed to be able to have an urban um, agriculture internship with both these organizations. And the D-Town Farm at Oakland Avenue is a marketplace where it was two partners who came together and said, let's do this together, let's figure it out. And the need was that COVID-19 had impacted the agriculture practices and the way they connected with their customers and the demands for safe food. And the online marketplace allows, allowed us to reimagine how we market and deliver our food. The design principles used were positive feedback movement, creative reframing, and alignment. And so the beauty of the farm I just wanted to share with you is very steeped in very healing properties, properties especially for me being a Black woman, where they're sitting there and they're working through and they're growing this beautiful, beautiful food in these majestic places, these urban farms in the city. 
That's me doing a participant observation because I did quite a few things to get us where we need to go. And, and, it, and it was amazing because I learned so much from everyone. Um, I was mainly online, but I had to come in and I wanted to see what was the actual experience of someone who was picking it up. So when I'm online helping them out, I can better understand what the customer needs are. My design methods that I use, I use alignment activities. We created a sustainable agreement. We did a feasibility study. I did rapid prototyping. Again, I did my participant observation and I surveyed 255 customers online. We did, um, we're, we're continuing about to do some focus groups and also did some expert interviews. This was my feasibility study. I took um, what was started from the Young Farmers Association and I spread it out and I found it other systems. And I was looking at it from the lens of equity and access, like who uses these systems? How do they use them? Can I access it? Are they accessible? Who does these systems serve? And so I hypothesized that it's an online system that I can create collectively with my organizations where we take the alienated values and we make the, we diminish them, the extractive values where we bring the authenticity of who we are and our culture in the unalienated flow of the system. So my systems, the systems and the blueprints that I am here to create is based in an agency and autonomy, belonging, change and transformation and self-determination and the distributive network sharing. Because we're here to share, we're here to conflict with one another, not compete. And so my critique of all these systems is that traditional agroecology is generative. We do not alienate other people as black and brown people and our labor, our ecological value and our social value is always positive feedback loops. So let's talk about the future. Because the future sometimes comes quite quickly. Are we here? Can everyone see this? All right. So welcome to the future. Welcome to the Lansing Food Cub, a free grocery delivery pilot for seniors. The purpose of the project is to offer a sustainable and affordable grocery delivery service to our senior community apartment complexes in the city of Lansing, Michigan, including a community store. Our services are, you can join the grocery delivery pilot, you can learn more about the project and you can take free online cooking classes. My project team is as follows. And my community partnerships built from the table of collaboration because we did that for sustainability and for community buy-in that this was important uh, enough for us to push through and make this happen. You can contact us, but the new model that I'm here to talk about is that here's our new model. We went from a grocery, an online grocery delivery system to now we're going to four apartment complexes and a community store will be located in, um, in one of them. And this is amazing. It's a lot of work that takes place in them, but this is the future and this is the new model that has been created. So welcome to SHOP. Detroit Farms. It went from D Town Farm and Oakland Avenue, and now it's Shop Detroit Farms for Detroit by Detroit Food for Detroiters. About us, Shop Detroit Farms is a collaborative network of Detroit growers and producers working to provide food that is environmentally and socially just. We're proud to offer nutritious options for our local community, and our organization uplifts and celebrates Black leadership, Black self determination, and Black joy. You could collaborate with us, you could come shop, you can become a vendor and you can learn more about what we do as a collaborative. My project team is as follows. And you can contact us at any time of day. The new model is that it went from an online ordering delivery system and now it's a food hub with 10 plus urban farms and also distribution to Detroit Food Co-op and other systems. 
It launches May 2021. And how I get here, I got here through a design process that I learned and that I created by working with my partnership, my partners. It's using um, old technologies, agrarian technologies where I'm holding space, I'm remembering, I'm creating, and I'm letting go. And I'm doing this through a series of questions that I ask myself, myself and my partners, whose research is this? Who owns it? Who interest does it serve? Who will benefit from this research? Who, who has designed the questions? Who has framed the scope? Who will carry it out? Who will write it up? How will the results be disseminated? Is my research agenda based upon a social model? And there's many other questions that I've created from this model. And if you're interested in learning more and creating new models, contact me. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you so much, Kisa. We're ready for some questions with you. Oh, okay. Doors open. Hopefully, you can hear. Can you all hear? Yeah, we can hear you. Hey, hey Kisa. This is Jeremy. Um, I can if you can. Can you guys all hear me fine? Yes, we hear you. Um, could you say a little bit more about the work you did around thinking about the extractive resource flows and the and the um, how to make sure that the empowerment components stayed within both the farming community and the consumption community? And given that the broader ecosystem that <laughs> of online food procurement, et cetera, tends to gravitate towards um, extracting those resources in concentrating in power and privilege how how did you work to make sure that your design elements um circumvented those inertias oh well i mean i'm i'm, I'm speaking straight from my partnerships thank you guys so much um well it was because jerry and malik was like let's do this together you know i like i don't need to have a online artist's unit Let's figure out how we do this collectively together. How do we build our own system? And luckily, I had that urban agriculture internship and I was perfect for it. <laughs> I mean, I think it worked itself out. Yeah. Did I answer your question, Jamie? Was it, was it another part to it? No, that, I mean, yeah, that was an answer. You basically said that you you uh, committed to it and you made it happen. I think for me, my head just gets in the space where I'm like, well, you know, the world is awash with convenience and much of that convenient convenience is platforms to us um, through systems that are extractive. And I know that it was important to you that um, you work with your partners to create a parallel system that wasn't extractive. So I, I guess I just was curious to hear more about that, but I, I think you answered yes, thank you. Nikki says, John. Well, hello, John. So you mentioned um, positive feedback looping. Can you maybe uh, give us an example of like uh, how you use those positive feedback loops? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, 
I had to understand about who we are as a people and what we value versus the extractiveness because we live in a world that really doesn't it, it, it doesn't really openly value the knowledge that we build as Black people and that we contribute to. Um, I said openly because a lot of stuff is stolen or co-opted co or bastardized. So what I attempted to do was that I came, I came in there and I was trying to figure out like, okay, what, what are they already doing? How are they already adding value um, within their organizations as well. And so if we're using extractive systems, I'm looking at who they are, how they operate, their missions and goals. I'm not there to put myself in it. And so I'm there to just help amplify and galvanize that feedback loop and make sure that, you know, even in the language that we use, you know, we're here to talk about Black joy. You know, we, we, we're here to show how we grow food, those type of things, even starting with the language, from the imagery, from how we choose to conduct ourselves online, and how we keep to our mission and our values and our goals. Thank you, Kisa. Uh, hello. Oh. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Patricia Coven. I just have like a couple questions for you. Um, I want to say that your presentation was excellent um, and just pretty much like passionate with every word that you spoke. It just flowed with ease. Um, so, you know, I congratulate you with um, everything that you're doing. Um, so like within um, the focus group that you uh, for your design methodology, what was the most impactful feedback that stood out from like that focus group within your design? Ah, it was the food stories. Like I, I, I typically, but with the Lansing uh, Food Club specifically, um, yeah, it was understanding like what kind of foods they ate, why. I mean, what was remembered? It was like these questions are like you know, I was working. I didn't workshop the questions just on my own. I workshopped the questions with my community members because. I wanted to center my work on what their needs were. And again, I'm just there to kind of galvanize. So we kind of workshop questions together, um, right. figure out like what, were, what, what was the needs of the project and what was the needs to the consumers and the people that we were trying to serve. Yeah, I, I just like, I totally understand with that collaboration and actually getting down to the nitty and gritty of, um, you know, what we were we here for and everything we'll be pushing for. It. And, um, you know, just making sure that, uh, you know, we're helping who, you know, who we supposed to be helping. So uh, I clearly understand that, especially with Lansing, because I go to MSU. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Also, uh, where do you see yourself in the work that you created uh, down the line, whether it be in a year or two years from now? Wow. Well, well I'm, I'm probably still like, I'm one of those type of designers that I like to see like it go through several iterations, you know, to make sure like when I step back, it's still, you know, it's still growing and, and forming. And so like, I still, I, I still will be working with them. <laughs> like that's my relationship, at least from my standpoint is that, you know, I'm here to make sure that the model is successful. And then at some point, you know, I gotta let go. I think we all gotta do it. I mean, parents do it teachers do it so yeah I, I will hope that you you know you wouldn't let it go anytime soon I just you know we're just seeing you know uh kind of more so like you know um just any goals or like what you was pushing for down the line with uh just expanding or um implementing more uh things with Intuit or just like that is what I'm, yeah kind of speaking on oh yeah I mean yeah I want to see the model grow you know um I want to see more farms uh, connected. I want to see where this food hub goes. I want to see how, you know, the Detroit Food Co-op grows. I want to see how, you know, the store grows in Lansing and how the grocery delivery is. Like, I got a lot of feedback, you know, the seniors, they, like, 
I was just there early this morning <laughs> with my last uh, iteration. And um, they were like, this has to stop. When, when will this start back up? I was like, we're, we're doing it in June. Like they, they felt relieved that they had help, that somebody actually cared. And they didn't have to go through the nuances of signing up and clicking or you know, or their introductory fees goes up or goes down or, or the store chooses to switch and say, I'm doing my own or, you know, everybody's in the business of e-commerce and making money that they're not really caring about the people that it affects. So thank you. I love your questions. <laughs> uh, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time out and presenting to us and um, God bless you. Thank you. We have time for one more question. I'll, I'll just be a, a glutton and ask another one. Kisa, if you had to share out, because I have the privilege of hearing you talk about design through the lens that you bring to the table at the campus farm and in the work that you do, if you wanted to share out specifically to the design community to think about the work that you've done and some of the end closing slides that you ended on, what do you think the take home message is to other designers um, in working with community and making those kinds of, of um, um, non-extractive um, resource flows? We have to ask the right questions of ourselves before we ask questions of other people. Like, what do what does food just justice looks look like in my community? Before you start going into other people's community, you know, like, what does this research mean to you? And will my will the will the research that I'm working on will it cause harm? to other people like these are like personal questions I feel like designers have to ask themselves um, before they start going into spaces that they're quite unfamiliar with or any space within itself like even when I was at the campus farm you know I was quite inquisitive I was so happy like that was where food and farming became real to me that was the synergy and um you know for my research for my first semester from that personal research you know I had my own research that I wanted to do through DNI, and I wanted to look at social innovation through DNI. And because of that, that's when I created that that gauge where every every week we're talking about some equity and access issue through questions, because so, questions raises your level of consciousness. It's not always the do. It's sometimes at sitting in that question and saying like, "Can you answer that?" before you ask somebody else to answer it for you. Oh, yeah. Um, shout out to the campus farms. <laughs> yeah, right on. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, Kisa. Yeah, great job, Kisa. Thanks. Um, I thought it would be really nice to take a couple of minutes here still while we have some time to uh, have the three uh, students here as kind of a panel. Um, you know, I haven't been in a room with them for, for months, so it's exactly. just what a pleasure to be together. <laughs> Uh, we, we started this journey out a year and a half ago as a team and uh, learning about this big wicked problem of food systems and you know the nature of a wicked problem is that it's overwhelming and it's big and hairy and ugly and how do you deal with it mentally how do you deal with it emotionally how do you start to work together as an integrative design team I mean I think you all have been through a bit of an emotional journey uh, of, of pushing and pulling on this big topic working together and then working individually. And I'm just kind of curious to see if you have reflections at this point about synergies or the benefits of uh, the challenges of integrative design, um, kind of stepping back from your own research and back into that bigger picture again. Yeah, I think one of the transitions that I've had through the program is I really came in thinking about designers as problem solvers and as solution makers. And especially looking at some of the wicked problem, realizing that 
yes, I could design a solution, quote unquote, but it would be such a drop in the bucket and it wouldn't have the impact that I wanted to see. And so um, as a designer, for me, it became, and I think for Kisa and Naj as well, designing the tools that others could then use repetitively to try to make change rather than me as the designer coming in with one specific object or solution to, to tackle the problem. Yeah. Um, I think for me, I, like, I changed a lot. Like I grew in so many different ways. I feel like I'm still growing um, as a person. Um, it's just been an extreme humbling experience to be able to work with um, so many different people from different disciplines and domains. Um, and taking that experience and kind of like interweaving it into the design space um, in order to like, you know, be like a, like a flame keeper you know, <laughs> as a facilitator and, and the keeper of the vision to keep it going. Um, yeah, like, I don't know if I can go back to my old job the same way <laughs> again. Yeah, also building off of what both of you said, actually, <clears throat> I think for me, it's been a um, process of sort of letting go of my ego because, you know, I came into, this pro program with this idea that, you know, as you also said, designer is a problem solver and designer is someone who knows a lot. Um, so I think that was challenged constantly through this integrative process because I was working with people, you know, climate change and food security. Those are really complex technical fields that, you know, obviously I don't know, I know very little about compared to them. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, for me also, it's been, I've, I've changed a lot and yeah, I think, that ego, designer's ego, and viewing myself as this solver of problems, I think that has been challenged and that has changed for and which is a great thing. Great. Yeah, so, you know, I think talking about newfound strength and being able to take on something that it's hard to visualize and it doesn't have tight boundaries on it is fantastic. I'm curious to hear about, you know, the future, if, if you're thinking food systems is still going to become a deeper uh, long-term engagement for you, or you know, if you're, you're thinking about other wicked problems, or, or how, how does the future start to come into focus? Yeah, I think one of the other surprises for me being in the program is that I do really want to continue working with food. Um, I came in really from like a healthcare and more education space and have really enjoyed using food as a lens to look back at some of those other issues and other wicked problems. So yeah, I do. I mean, one, I intend to continue working on my thesis, this thesis work on an ongoing basis um, and looking at other issues in education around food, but it's definitely something I want to continue forward. Yeah, for me, I think <clears throat> what I've used in my work, um, I spoke in my presentation about this idea of being comfortable with complexity. Um, that's something that I think um, I'm excited about using that sort of way of approaching things um, to food, yes, and climate change. And those, I'm, I'm, I've been really interested in climate change and impact of climate change. So I think what I've learned through the process and the tools that I've uh, used in, in this process, I, I can absolutely see myself um, continuing down that path. Mapping, for example, it's, it's just really fascinating for me. And, I would absolutely love to continue working with that and learning more about that. Excellent. Yeah, for me, I feel like, um, you know, equity and access is a theme. And, um, you know, from my studies of what the food system is comprised of, you can trace every inequity known to man by looking at food. And so I'm pretty much prepared, I feel, um, depending on the project and if my values align with the project values and the team, I'm pretty confident that um, I'll be there to be able to, you know, be part of a team to help figure something out. You know, either help redesign something or create something totally new. Mm -hmm. You know, I like that. <laughs> yeah, and Kisa and I are both on the Washington Food Policy Council now, so we're signed up for two years at least. So. Excellent. 
Fantastic. I don't know if there's questions from the, the audience if they'd like to address to the whole group as a group. I have one. Go ahead, Frank. So given your informed opinions about <clears throat> design writ large, um, how would you, at this point in time, uh, define what you think integrative design is? I thought we were waiting for thesis review for that, Frank. <laughs> well, see this as a primer. <laughs> your, uh, thesis. You know, it's, it's funny, I've been talking about this a lot, sort of practicing on my husband to teach him how to explain what I am doing and what my degree is in. And the way I, I sort of initially started talking about it as a designer who sort of thinks about those fields that are siloed, you know, in academics or whether they're um, uh, communities, so they're location-based or interest-based, those sort of silos and forming the connection between those two. Um, and I sort of evolved that a little bit. And now um, when I was talking to him, I was talking about it more as a designer who thinks about designing those interactions between people of different groups of some sort. And so I feel like in my thesis work, that's definitely how I've been thinking about it is designing these interactions in my case between students and decision makers and the space that they inhabit um, and how I, I make those connections, so. Yeah. Yeah, I feel, um, I don't know, I think I'm gonna be a little poetic with mine, but I feel like um, integrative design is about interweaving disconnections um, and how you kind of create dis distribution and connections to them um, and help and facilitate that process for other people to see it as well. Well, I, I don't have an answer, but I, I've, I've definitely felt uh, what integrative design is through my work. I, I saw it happening and I, I, I could, you know, tell that this is integrative design, but I still, I still struggle to um, describe it and define it for other people. That's something that I think will take more reflection, but I definitely, I, I can, I can recognize it when I see it, but it's hard to like, define it. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask a, um, maybe even a larger question, Frank? I'm going to up you a little bit here. Yes, sure. Um, sure, of course. You all, you all have been in this program for two years now. Um, how has it changed you, either as uh, individuals, uh, but perhaps uh, most importantly as, well, no, that's probably the most important, but as designers and individuals? You came in, I, I suspect, with certain expectations and hopes and dreams of what this might do to you. Um, what has the result of the last two years been on you? And um, I'm not going to ask you to extract COVID from that because you probably can't. Um, but uh, all given, I'd love to hear how you've been impacted by the program. Yeah, I think I think for me, Brad, it's been like a, a huge transition. I came in sort of, um, I came from a background in fine arts and fashion design. And so I sort of thought of myself as a designer, but really I was just creating things that I liked. Um, and then at some point in my work, I found that I was starting to do this more integrative design process and working with people of different fields to sort of, but still to develop objects. Um, and sort of was still thinking, I think, of design as a sort of process to create um, a very, a, a solution to a problem. And so I think for me, the huge transition has been to really think of um, how I can use design to empower others. I mean, I think that's been huge that instead of just designing something for them that I then give back to them based on their needs, it's really about supporting them and acknowledging their assets and getting other people to acknowledge their own assets in a really positive way. And that, um, that for me as a, as a person and a designer has been a big major transition. Um, for me, I think um, the past few years and now, I think they have made my life a lot more difficult because I have a lot more questions than I used to, and I'm a lot more annoyed with things. And 
Yeah, I think <laughs> also maybe I'm a more annoying person as a result of this program. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, like a very specific example that, um, so I'm generally like on the side, even though I don't have a lot of time, but I'm sometimes looking for at jobs that I could work at and I'm, I'm just so picky. I'm like, okay, you know, this is too capitalistic or this is, this is um, uh, perpetuating inequality. So in that sense, I think I've become a lot more critical of basically everything. And um, yeah, that makes life difficult, but I'm glad that uh, I had that experience. Um, for me, I've learned to accept who I am, like authentically more, even though, you know, it wasn't like I had, I didn't have opposition being here, but I was allowed to be around, I call, I call them jackknots, um, <laughs> which is something much deeper than mentorship with even me coming into the program with Joe and then I met Jeremy. Um, and Audrey, I mean, I came to the school because I saw Audrey and I saw her, I saw me. I was like, I saw her as a designer. I was like, I'm going to be a designer. And then, you know, there's just so many people, like even the 21st century design class with, with John, um, that was so rigorous. But at the end, I understand now that I cannot work with anyone who does not have alignment with the values of who I am. And so that, that, that's like deep to me now. I'm very extremely value driven. And like Naj, again, I'm sensitive to context with anyone. And I'm like, what, is, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> or like, you're being harmful. Like that's, that's something is hurting me here. And that's real because that's my intuition calling it out saying like something's wrong. And, um, and I feel like I'm a better person. Like if we're working with my community partners, I feel like I have a, a, such a, a deep, deep understanding about what humanity needs. Like, if I can't see humanity in myself, how am I going to see it in some uh, some other people? And I feel like I learned that from the partnerships, um, from my community partners. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm I'm a different person. Thank you for sharing those those uh, personal thoughts from each of you. Appreciate it. Thanks for that Thanks, question. Guys. I think that was a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> Anything about COVID that you guys wanted to extrapolate about? <laughs> you know, I, I'm for like, I, I, you know, I had issues with it because, you know, like the beauty about this program was that we had access to so many things, you know, like <laughs> we could, and when COVID hit and things got shut down, I was like, wait a minute, you know, like we couldn't access this and we couldn't access that. And so like, and then the community projects I was working on, I mean, I mean, people were dying. People are still dying. I mean, people dying. I don't understand why we're acting like everything is the same. People are dying. People are getting sick. People don't have resources. People don't have access to things. And to me, that's a call for me to be more of like standing into who I am as a designer more than anything of today because of that reason. Mm -hmm. Like we got work to do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the other thing that's been interesting for like us and how we work as a team, like what COVID has done, because oh, yeah. um, as we became a smaller group and then as we were forced to work separately, I feel like we've also found ways to overlap and connect our thesis that has been sort of really fun and interesting working in that online space and acknowledging that we all had to use online tools, um, connecting over building platforms or figuring out what we needed to do you know, what needed to be physical versus what needed to be digital. I don't know. I feel like that's been really sort of fun and interesting to, to oh, go yeah. through. And even have somebody like to throw ideas around with, like, now I feel like I got, you know, I got the, the, a design brother and design sister. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, Nash, what about this? Or mm -hmm. what about that? You know, I don't feel alone. Design siblings. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, there's a question in chat from uh, Grace Wu. Um, wondering if you could reflect on how you've come to terms with the limitations of the limiting, the lingering contradictions of the final design iterations you've come up with. What is that? What she said? Um, wondering if you could reflect on how you've come to terms with the limitations or lingering contradictions of the final design iterations you've made. 
I mean, I don't know. I, you know, I've been designing. I've been designing in the online world for quite some time, and I mean, it's just a rule of thumb that you don't really. I mean, you got to do three iterations in order for it to feel like this is it. This is what it is. Um, you you still exploring and figuring things out, seeing what works and what doesn't. So, like, I'm kind of okay with you know something being irregular. I'm 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 comfortable being in that emergent space where something is still kind of nebulous mm -hmm. or I, I can't see it quite clearly. I can see this mm. and then it might change, you know, I'm okay with that. Also, I think there's value in the process that led to that design outcome and um, sure the design outcome might have a lot of limitations, but I think for me, I'm looking to learn from that process of how I arrived, how we arrived at that design outcome. And uh, yes, what that does make possible, uh, even though it does have limitations. So I think um, I'm less interested in that design artifact itself, but uh, one the process and what that, that probably makes possible. So yeah, the design outcome might might be very limited, but I think there's still a lot to be learned uh, from, from that. Yeah, I think I agree with that. And one thing that my partner has been so great about reminding me about all the time is that curriculum, when you're thinking about curriculum at all, especially at the high school level, really does need to continue to adapt and change, especially if it's on in, in an online space. And so to think about, you know, even if it is limited, what can I do now and what should happen later and how I can think about, you know, building with that in mind, but knowing that it will constantly be a work in progress if I'm doing my job right. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. That's good. Good question. Thank you. Well, I think. We can wrap up here. I, I'd, I'd like to add, boy, what, what a pleasure it's been to get to know the three of you over the past couple of years. Speaking as a person who um, uh, obsessively reads about climate change and lives in a food system and thinks about it every day, and it gets overwhelming to me. Um, you know, I've taken great solace seeing you get smarter and stronger and better and, you know, working tirelessly to, to Make the world a better place. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Makes me happy. <laughs> so um, before we wrap up, um, I do want to do some more thank yous. Everyone did a great job in thanking their own partners and their thesis committees. Uh, I wanted to formally thank M Dining for being a partner with us last year, especially Alex Bryan, Keith Soster, Steve Mangan. Uh, especially want to thank the farm at St. Joseph Hospital in Ypsilanti. Liz Highlander was a great partner for us. Yeah. Uh, dean Guna Medadron for his support of the program, Associate Dean Bradley Smith for his support of the program and the students. MDES Program Director Audrey Bennett for her support of the students in the program. Former MDES Program Director John Marshall for his support of the students in the program. Uh, big shout out to Graduate Program Coordinator Megan Jellema for her support of the students in the program. Big, big support Thank you to the students for all of their hard work and dedication. And thank you to all of you <laughs> for being here. So Ooh, have a you. great weekend. Thank you for being here. I got one more thing. Yeah, I got, one more I, thing. I, I, can I give a shout out to my advisor, Ron English? Look, <laughs> the revolution will not be televised. The revolution shall be self-organized and self-determined. That's not Ron. Right. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Good job, everybody.